Hey, what's up everybody? Today we're going to be talking Candida vulval vaginitis. Now this simply means that we have vulval vaginal inflammation that's secondary to Candida, which is nothing more than a fungi. Now it's very important to remember that this is not a sexually transmitted disease. So it's very important that we reassure patients that this is not an STD. Now the majority of infection is going to be due to Candida albicans. 90% of these symptoms are going to be due to Candida albicans. The remaining 10% are going to be due to Candida glabrata. Now albicans is really going to present with a more severe presentation. Glabrata is going to be presenting with a more mild infection. But like I said, the majority of times it's going to be due to albicans. Now Candida really is part of the normal vaginal flora. It's really presumed that Candida makes its way from the rectum because it's also present in the GI tract from the rectum into the vaginal canal. Now how it goes from asymptomatic colonization to producing symptoms and symptomatic disease is really unknown. So the exact mechanism, we're not quite sure, but there are certain risk factors that we have to look out for. Things like diabetes, high estrogen containing birth control pills, contraceptive devices such as IUD um, or the vaginal ring, um, and even recent antibiotic use. So these are all things that can predispose the patient to having candida vulvovaginitis. Now things like douching, tampons, and tight clothing, these are gonna be very weak risk factors. They're still considered to be possible causes, but they're very weakly associated. And this is more so for the patient that has recurrent vaginal infections. Now recurrent vaginal infection simply means that we have four infections in a 12 month period. All right, moving on to the symptoms that are present with vulvovaginitis. Now really the cardinal symptom here is gonna be vaginal pruritus, which means we have itching. Other common complaints here are gonna be dysuria, which is gonna be painful urination, dyspareunia, which is gonna be pain during intercourse, and irritation as well. Now symptoms are often gonna worsen one week before menses, and discharge may or may not be present. So we can't necessarily use the complaint of having vaginal discharge to rule in or rule out this diagnosis. Now classically, when discharge is present, it's gonna present as thick and white discharge, cottage cheese-like, and it's gonna be adherent to the vaginal walls. It doesn't always present this way, and it can really present as any other type of vaginitis. Candida can have loose discharge, thin discharge, watery discharge, yellow discharge, so it can really present like any other type of vaginitis, like I said. Now, to make a clinical diagnosis, if it presents classically, then it's easy, go ahead and start treatment. If it doesn't present classically, you have pruritus, but you have thin or watery discharge, then go ahead and confirm this with laboratory confirmation. Now when doing a physical exam, aside from looking for discharge, we're also gonna notice edema of the vulva and the vaginal canal. We're also gonna look for erythema in the vaginal canal, and we're gonna look for escorations that are also gonna be seen on physical exam. All right, moving on to the diagnosis of candida vulval vaginitis. Like I said, if they present classically pruritus, thick white vaginal discharge, then go ahead and treat these patients empirically with the topical azole. If, for whatever reason, they don't present classically, or if the patient already went and bought an over-the-counter medication like Monistat, then at this point, I would do laboratory testing and I would start with a wet mount. Now, the wet mount is going to be useful in diagnoses candida. However, it's also gonna be useful in excluding other diagnoses like bacterial vaginosis and trichomoniasis. Now, not only as primary infection, but as a possible co-infection with candida as well. Keep in mind that these wet mounts can appear negative in up to half patients that are diagnosed with candida on culture. If the patient was given treatment, they don't get better, then the next step here is gonna to be to do a vaginal culture. If the wet mount is negative, but they still have symptoms, also indication to do a culture. The culture is gonna be useful not only in diagnosing candida, but also gonna be useful in possibly identifying azole resistant candida infections and non-albicant species. So the culture is very useful. You don't need to send any special culture. Any regular bacterial culture can actually diagnose candida infection as well. Now, patients that have resistance or recurrent infection might also benefit from doing a diabetic screen. A lot of patients initially present with recurrent or persistent vaginitis when they are newly diagnosed with diabetes because of their uncontrolled glucose. So an in-office finger stick might be useful in these patients as well. Now let's get into the more specific treatment of candida vaginitis. 
All right, moving on to the treatment of Canada vulval vaginitis. Now, it's going to be pretty straightforward for the uncomplicated case here, but it's going to be a little bit more difficult when we start treating the complicated cases. When dealing with the uncomplicated cases, we're typically going to go with a topical azole like clotrimazole or with fluconazole, 150 milligrams, and it's only going to be a one-time dosing for fluconazole. When doing a topical azole, we can treat from anywhere from three to seven days. They even have some over-the-counter medications with topical azoles that are once dosing as well. Now, we have to keep in mind this is not sexually transmitted, so there's no contraindication to the patient continuing to have intercourse. It might be a little bit uncomfortable because like we said, one of these symptoms is gonna be dyspareunia, but there's no adverse reaction, there's no contraindication to having sexual intercourse while on treatment. Now, like we said, this is going to be easy. It's going to be more difficult when we start dealing with a complicated patient. Now, complicated cases here are going to be severe disease in the immunocompromised patient, uncontrolled diabetes, pregnancy. These are all going to be indications for either prolonged treatment or switching up the treatment slightly as well. Now, we can still treat with topical azoles and we can still treat with fluconazole. If we're going to choose a topical azole like clotrimazole, then for the most part, we're gonna to wanna to go for seven to 14 days of treatment. If we're going to be using fluconazole, 150 milligrams, then we're gonna extend the dosing. Now, when we do fluconazole, it really stays, we have therapeutic, um, therapeutic levels of the medication in the secretions that last for up to 72 hours. This means that one pill is good for 72 hours. So if we dose one pill every three days for three consecutive doses, this will eradicate the candida infection. Now, both topical and oral therapy are gonna be equally as effective. They both have 90% cure rate, so they're both good first-line options here. The one exception that I would make is the ease of oral fluconazole is probably gonna be more beneficial. It's probably gonna be easier for the patient as opposed to doing once daily dosing for 14 days. We're also gonna to wanna to avoid fluconazole in pregnancy. Now, giving fluconazole as in first-line treatment in the first trimester has been associated with spontaneous abortions in up to half of women that take the medication. It has not been associated with any birth defects. There's a little bit of uh, you know, some skepticism if this is true or not, but I would definitely say avoid fluconazole, especially in the first trimester, especially when we have other options like topical azole therapy like clotrimazole. Now, when giving clotrimazole, I would advise treating these patients for seven days not the one day regimen, not the three day regimen, continue treating your pregnant patient for seven days. You also have to keep in mind that treatment of candida vulval vaginitis is only required in symptomatic women. There is no need to treat the asymptomatic woman and there's no need to treat candidiasis in order to prevent fetal adverse outcomes. Having candida does not affect the pregnancy in any way. So we're only treating for symptoms here. So we have to remember that. All right, now moving on to those women who have recurrent infection. If you remember, this means that we have over four infections in a 12 month period. Now there are certain things that we're gonna wanna change prior to actually starting this suppressive therapy. We're gonna want to make sure that they have their glucose level under control if they're diabetic. We're gonna wanna avoid panty liners. We're gonna wanna avoid lubricants. And finally, we're gonna wanna think about maybe switching this patient to a lower dose estrogen pill if they are on oral contraception. High doses of estrogen predispose the patient to developing candidiasis. Now, if we have all these things in place, then we can start thinking about suppressive therapy after we successfully cured the initial infection. Now, suppressive therapy is really gonna be done with fluconazole, 150 milligrams. We're gonna give it once a week for a period of six months. After six months, we can stop the therapy and we can see how the patient responds. Now, unfortunately, about 50% of patients are gonna relapse, and if that's the case, then we put them right back on this once weekly regimen and we do this for another year and we see how they respond after a year. Now, low dose fluconazole once a week at 150 milligrams really doesn't have any adverse reactions. It doesn't cause any issues with the liver. We don't need any routine laboratory monitoring for giving extended periods of fluconazole. Lastly, probiotics. Now, probiotics have not been shown to reduce the incidence of recurrent candida infection. 
With that said, I don't think that they cause any harm and it's definitely good to advise, or I think it's definitely safe to say that we can still advise patients to try probiotics and see if they work. Now, when dealing with the mother with a newborn, fluconazole is safe during breastfeeding periods. You have to keep in mind that it is excreted in the breast milk, but according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, they consider this to be a safe medication during breastfeeding. All right, so that concludes today's lecture on Candida vulvovaginitis.